able to register, to become first-class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America? Wow, one of the leading voices of the civil rights movement, Fannie Lou Hamer, speaking at the 1964 Democratic National Convention in New Jersey. And joining us now, two-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Tom Ricks. And we continue our week-long discussion of his new book entitled Waging a Good War, a Military History of the Civil Rights Movement, 1954 to 1968. And also with us... Uh, is retired U.S. Army Ranger Adrian Lewis. He's professor of military history at the University of Kansas. And one of the reasons Adrian is on today is that we're going to focus on the civil rights movement uh, and Tom's book and the lessons they learned actually from the military. Why don't, Tom, why don't you sort of set the scene for us as to what you have in your book, what you learned about how this nonviolent movement actually learned some incredible philosophies from the military itself. They learned a lot from the military. And one thing I loved about writing this book that I found so fascinating is as I wrote it, I began to think, wow, the U.S. Yeah. military also could learn a lot from the classic civil rights movement. Uh, both organizations, the civil rights movement and the U.S. military, are very good at two basic tasks, training, uh, and tactics. The U.S. military excels at tactics, how to fight, what to do on the battlefield. Where I think the civil rights movement really outstrips the U.S. military, especially in the last 20 years or so, watching the U.S. military flounder in Afghanistan and in Iraq, mm -hmm. is the U.S. military is not as good as the civil rights movement at formulating strategy. That's the beginning point. And that's something I'm interested to hear what Professor Lewis has to say about that. And the end point, what do you want the end game to look like? What is what the U.S. military would call phase four, uh, which is what the civil rights movement called reconciliation. What do we want mm -hmm. things to look like at the end? They always thought about it from the very beginning, as their strategic song put it, keep your eyes on the prize. Well, and Professor Lewis, why don't I uh, let you respond to that uh, question and, and those thoughts about uh, where the U.S. military could, could learn from the civil rights movement and also what you thought of the book. First, uh, thanks for having me. It's uh, good to be with you. And congratulations, Tom. It's a great piece of work. Uh, I've, I've read all your work. As a matter of fact, I've reviewed some of your work, and uh, I, I appreciate what you, uh, the contributions that you make. The, uh, I, I agree with what you said. I, I agree with the argument you're advancing here. Uh, I, I would even push it back further, though. I would go all the way back to the policy, policy making part of it. Uh, in World War II, we got the policy right. When we got to the Vietnam War, we didn't get the policy right. In, in other words, when it comes to taking the moral high ground, you would say I would say that in World War II, we got it right. Uh, in Vietnam, we associated ourselves with uh, French imperialism. Uh, we uh, were not able to uh, tell the American people the truth about uh, what we were doing in Vietnam. You, are, mm. you as you know, uh, McNamara uh, lied to the American people about Vietnam. Nixon lied to the American people about Vietnam. And as a consequence of that, uh, you know the outcome of, of, of Vietnam. So I, I, I would say two things. One, get the policy right in the first place, and then the strategy will come. If you're on the right side, and in the civil rights movement, as you have pointed out in your book, uh, Martin Luther King and those leaders, they're on the right side of history. Uh, yeah. They are espousing and promoting values and ethics that are more in line with American, with uh, the founding fathers' values and ethics, not with the segregationists, not with the Jim Crow uh, proponents. So. Uh, I, I'd say get the policy right first, and then the strategy will come uh, after that. So, well, in, in fact... Also, in your book, 
uh, uh, about the culture of the American military. Uh, you also reach back to your roots as an Army Ranger about how essential it is to perceive the truth and to tell the truth to your comrades in battle. Could you talk about that? Right. Yeah. No, you're you're right. In your book, I, I appreciate that you uh, you quote the uh, Ranger Handbook there about how significant mm -hmm. it is to uh, to tell the truth. Uh, and and we don't have to look back far in our history to see the problems with with lying to the American people. Uh, we can take a look at the uh, war in Iraq. Uh, George W. Bush and uh, Colin Powell were not straightforward with the American people uh, about WNDs, about uh, the significance of the threat from uh, Saddam Hussein, and as a consequence of that, we lost the support of the American people. I, I was I was listening to the program a little bit earlier, and we we're talking about the inability of some in the GOP to not tell the truth. Well, well, there will be consequences for that. I, I, we're still waiting, but yes, I'm hoping that there are consequences for lying and for completely just deleting your core values from your party. But we'll right. leave that right there. Mm -hmm. Tom, um, let's point out, uh, uh, the professor talked about the Army Ranger Handbook. Here's in your book uh, discussing how civil rights leaders took a page from the U.S. Army when it came to how they shared information with each other. The U.S. Army's Ranger Handbook carries one of the rules supposedly promulgated in 1759 by Major Robert Rogers during the French and Indian War. Tell the truth about what you see and what you do. There is an army depending on us for correct information. Similarly, one lesson civil rights activist Diane Nash had taken away from participating in sit-ins was that it was absolutely essential to report ground truth accurately. When you're really honest with yourself and honest with other people, you give yourself and them the opportunity to solve problems using reality instead of lack of reality. That makes problem solving much more efficient and clearly uh, you talk about the impact of, of doing things this way in your book I just want to jump to today and ask you <laughs> Tom to comment on, on where we are when there are so many levels of truth and how that ultimately uh, affects the civil right, rights movement of today. When people won't have the courage to tell the truth as they see it when they think that political power is best obtained by lying, you wind up with a chaotic and fraught situation. You will not build a lasting peace based on lies. It really strikes me, you quoted Diane Nash, she had the courage of her convictions. After the mm -hmm. terrible Birmingham church bombing in September 1963, four little girls blown up by 16 sticks of dynamite in a church, what could be more uncivilized? Diane Nash had the courage to write a memo to Martin Luther King and other leaders of the movement telling they, they were handling the response to that badly, that there was a lot of negative energy circulating at the funeral and at the crowds, and that they needed to follow the basic civil rights movement's principle of recycling negative energy into something positive. She said, you are failing as leaders. You need to get out there and do something. Tom Ricks, thank you. He'll be back with us tomorrow for more on the new book, Waging a Good War, A Military History of the Civil Rights Movement, 1954 to 1968. Retired U.S. Army Ranger Adrian Lewis, thank you as well, Professor, for being on this morning. And